Uh, the Bradshaw Library's Archives of Special Collections fundraising efforts unfortunately have been significantly impacted due to the COVID crisis. Um, if you would like to donate, uh, please visit the links as seen here. That will also be in the chat as well. If you would like to make a contribution, um, if you do want to make a contribution, please be sure to select other from the drop down menu and type library archives in the designation section. Donors for of $30 or more will receive a 16 inch by 24 inch printed copy of the fight for the ballot exhibition poster. Um, and then let me go ahead and start the video. We have a video presentation. Um, the League of Women Voters in Sanibel um, did a dramatic reading um, that brings to life the struggles and challenges the heroes of the women's movement faced. Um, after the reading, there will be a Q&A uh, with Professor of History, Dr. Frances Davey, and Sanibel League of Women Voters member, Madeline Studer, and Governing Board of Progressive Women of Southwest Florida member, Audrea Anderson. Without further ado, let me go ahead and start that video for you all. Hi, everybody. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you to Robin and to the board of the Santa Bell League of Women Voters for inviting us to present Voices for Women's Suffrage at this Toast of Tenacity. I am a Florida delegate to Vision 2020, a national coalition of individuals and organizations dedicated to women's social, political, and economic equality. In 2010, Vision 2020 inaugurated a toast to tenacity as a way to celebrate and highlight the courageous and tenacious and very often overlooked heroes of women's suffrage. In 2017, my friend Audrea Anderson and I first introduced the toast to tenacity to lead. Hello? Can anybody hear? Because nobody can hear. Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. Nobody can hear the video. Yeah, Bailey, now I can. Bailey if you're on the call, if you muted yourself, you've muted the whole screen. Oh, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. I was just trying to stop the noise. Let me start that again. It's okay. League of Women Voters for inviting us to present Voices for Women's Suffrage at this Toast of Tenacity. I am a Florida delegate to Vision 2020, a national coalition of individuals and organizations dedicated to women's social, political, and economic equality. In 2010, Vision 2020 inaugurated a toast to tenacity as a way to celebrate and highlight the courageous and tenacious and very often overlooked heroes of women's suffrage. In 2017, my friend Audrea Anderson and I first introduced the toast to tenacity to Lee County. This is our fourth annual toast. Alice Paul, pictured here with her glass of grape juice held high, toasted the passage of the 19th Amendment exactly 100 years ago today, on August 26, 1920. Later in the program, as you heard, we'll have our own toast, but you do not have to drink grape juice. And we won't. <laughs> <laughs> and you won't, that's right. Thanks. It's a pleasure to have so many friends with us today, 68 so far, and I think we had 100 signed up, but you know, the vagaries of Zoom and whatever. Anyway, you're from across the country today, all the way from Texas, where my daughter is, and Maine, where Carol Guestwicky is. So uh, 
It's great to have everybody here. This could never happen except for the beauty of Zoom. But actually, we're part of a much larger celebration. Across the country today, thousands of individuals and hundreds of organizations, all members of Vision 2020, are gathering virtually to celebrate the passage of the 19th and the heroes who made it possible. The programs will differ, but we all honor the tenacity of suffragists. So today we're going to learn more about our shared history. Remember that image of Alice Paul we were just looking at? She may have appeared to be a conventional young woman, but Alice, the suffrage suffragists you will hear from today, and the thousands of others who came before and after her were anything but conventional. They were revolutionaries. They fought against the centuries old white male dominated power structure and they fought for equal rights for all women. We hope that this history of the fight for the right to vote inspires and motivates each of us to keep working together for equality and justice for all. Now let me introduce you to Audrea Anderson. Thank you, Maddie. I am Audrea Anderson, a member of the governing board of the Progressive Women of Southwest Florida and past president of the Fort Myers Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. We are happy to be with you today. As we celebrate the passage of the 19th Amendment, I am honored to present Voices for Women's Suffrage a piece that Maddie and I wrote and produced in 2019. The voices you will hear today represent just a small group of the courageous women and men, both black and white, who fought for our rights over a 70 year period. Several of the ladies in today's performance are members of the Fort Myers Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. It is an African-American sorority that was founded in January of 1913 and only two months later marched in the Great Suffragist Parade in Washington, D.C. for the right to vote. During the long struggle for the right to vote, Black women faced challenges of racism, even from many white suffragists and especially among Southern women. Nevertheless, Black women persisted within the coalition. And today, Black women are the most loyal voting bloc for candidates who stand for equal rights and social justice. Remember, 96% of Black women voted for the woman candidate in the 2016 presidential election. Clearly, the sorority has continued its founder's legacy of fighting for equality and social justice. With voices today, we honor those well-known and those too often overlooked by the history books. We hope this performance will help inspire momentum and motivation to build a future with no impediments to voting. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Voices for Women's Suffrage. She's the cutest. I don't have any volume. Abigail Adams. When my husband John was in Philadelphia with the other white men of privilege and, and uh, property, writing the Declaration of Independence in uh, 1776, I wrote to him and I said, remember the ladies or we shall surely foment a rebellion and will not stand, be bound by laws in which we have no say or voice or representation. He didn't listen. They wrote, all men are created equal. 
I am Sadrana Truth, an abolitionist and a women's rights activist. I escaped slavery and began a speaking and preaching crusade for human rights. I spoke to hundreds of audiences in Ohio, New York, Michigan, and Massachusetts, focusing in on women's rights, in particular, our right to vote. Often, I would bring the house down with my rasping singing voice and my moving oration coupled with Bible truths. One of my quotes that went viral was, I feel safe in the midst of my enemies, for that truth is all powerful and will prevail. I'm Elizabeth Cady Stanton, an early leader of the women's suffrage movement. African American and white women across the nation formed women's clubs where they gained the knowledge, organizational, and oratorical skills that would serve us well in the rebellion for equal rights. I organized the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. The Declaration of Sentiments I wrote was our call for equal rights and a rallying point for feminists across the country. As a gifted orator and a fiery writer, I spoke at conventions, authored influential books on women's suffrage, and even wrote many of my dear friend Susan B. Anthony's speeches. I am Frederick Douglass, icon of civil rights, I escaped slavery, taught myself to read and write, and became a leading national voice for human rights through my actions and my newspaper, The North Star. Later, I wrote, knowledge is the pathway from slavery to freedom. I worked closely with my friends, Susan Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and others in the abolition of slavery movement. And we worked just as passionately for women's suffrage. My compelling orations at Seneca Falls convinced the audience to include women's suffrage in the declarations of sentiments. I'm Susan B. a pioneer activist for human rights, starting with my work for, women, for the abolition of slavery. You know my work for women's suffrage. For 50 years, I gave the suffrage movement force and direction. That's why the 19th Amendment is often called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. My other social reform efforts also came to fruition. Women's right to own property separate from their husband, a woman's right to be a joint guardian of her children, a woman's right to enter into contracts, a girl's right to sit in a classroom alongside boys, and a woman's right to attend colleges and universities and learn alongside men. I've dedicated my life to the struggle for human rights. I am Mary Ann Shad Carey, a journalist, teacher, lawyer, and national newspaper publisher where I promoted abolitionists of slavery and women's suffrage. In my day, newspapers were very influential. They were the only purveyors of news and important current issues. As a publisher, I provided strong editorial commentary and culture in my newspaper. As a journalist, I wielded strong influence in the evolution of slavery and later in the women's suffrage movement. I founded the women's, colored women's progressive franchise, which advocated women's rights. I joined the National Women's Suffrage Association and worked with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Together, we testified for women's rights before the Judiciary Committee of the United States House of Representatives. None of us who began the rebellion for equal rights lived long enough to exercise our own right to vote. None of us could be certain that universal adult suffrage would be achieved. 
those who came after us continued the struggle. We are the pioneering voices behind the 19th Amendment. I am Dr. Anna Julia Cooper, educator, writer, and activist who advocated for civil rights and men's rights. In my day, I was known as the Black Feminist. I established local organizations for women, young people. I created African Americans of the YBU and YMCA to provide support for young Blacks moving from the South. These organizations helped to address issues involving education, housing, and unemployment, issues directly leading. My first book, Voice of South by a Woman of the South, calls for equal education for women and promoted my belief that educated African-American women were key to uplifting the entire race. I lectured up and internationally on topics of civil rights, education, and the status of women. I am the only woman of any color quoted in a passport. The cause freedom does not call the race, sex, or a class. It is called the very product of humanity. I am Ida B. Wells Barnett, civil rights and women's rights activist, teacher, and journalist. I was nationally and internationally known for my incisive investigative journalism into the heinous crime of lynching. In Chicago, I was very active in the National Women's Club movement and traveled the speaking circuit advocating for women's suffrage. In the 1913 Women's Suffrage Parade in Washington, D.C., instead of marching at the back of the line as I was directed, I insisted on marching with my Chicago delegation. I am Mary Church Terrell, a national activist for civil rights and women's suffrage, orator, educator, and journalists. I am a founding member of the NAACP and a founding organizer of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority. My relationship with Susan B. Anthony was a delightful, helpful friendship. I worked with Frederick Douglass on civil rights campaigns, organized Black women in America to fight against lynching, and for educational reform. I picketed the Wilson White House for better treatment of Black veterans. I fought for women's suffrage and civil rights because I recognized I belonged to the only group in this country that has two such huge obstacles to surmount, both sex and race. I was recognized internationally as a leader for civil rights. My highest profile speech was delivered in Berlin, Germany at the International Congress for Women. I received a rousing ovation when I delivered my address, first in German, next in French, and lastly in English. I was the only black woman present. I am Alice Paul. While studying in England, I joined the suffragette movement there. From there, I learned the value of the militant headline. Grabbing, sorry, I'm trying to. Headline grabbing protests and civil disobedience. In 1913, we organized the first women's march in Washington, D.C. What was our goal? 
a constitutional amendment for women's suffrage. Our march of 8,000 strong brought half a million people out to support us, but some came to heckle and harass us. A near riot ensued. I continued to organize and protest, and in 1917, 1,000 silent sentinels, women in white from across the nation, began 18 months of picketing the White House. We endured verbal and physical attacks. Instead of protecting our right to free speech and peaceful assembly, the police arrested us. We were held into deplorable conditions and suffered inhumane treatment. We were beaten and force fed. This mobilized public opinion, producing greater awareness and sympathy for our cause. By 1918, President Wilson announced his support for women's suffrage and called for an amendment to the Constitution. I am Naomi Sewell Richardson, one of 22 founders of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated on Howard University's campus in 1913. My sisters and I formed this sorority because we wanted to engage in community service and fight for human rights to improve the welfare and quality of life for humanity. Two months after we organized, we joined the Women's Suffrage March of 1913 in Washington, D.C. That experience set the stage for our lives' work. First, we were regulated to the back of a parade of 8,000 strong. The violence from hecklers was frustrating and terrifying. We persisted. Many of our parents asked us not to march because they feared for our safety. But we were passionate about our cause and held the DST banner high and marched anyway. The legacy of persistent and passion for social justice and human rights was passed down to the current generation of over 300,000 Deltas in over 1,100 chapters around the world. I am Carrie Chapman Cat. For more than 40 years, I was one of the most powerful and influential women behind the national suffrage movement. I worked tirelessly to pass the 19th Amendment in state legislature and was in Nashville, Tennessee on that historic day in August 1920. I founded the League of Women Voters in February 1920, five months before the ratification of the 19th Amendment, because I believed that every voter needs nonpartisan information and education about the critical issues of the day. I'm Harriet Hebrew. On the 25th day of August, 1920, a very hot day in many respects, I cast a swing vote in the Tennessee legislature that changed the course of U.S. history. It made the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution a reality. Of course, the night before the vote, I received a letter from my mother that said, Harry, do the right thing by the ladies. We are the voices that push the 19th Amendment across the finish line. The 19th Amendment did become the law of the land in 1920, but it was not until the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that the American ideal, all people are created equal, was codified into law. 
even today, 100 years later, there is still work to do. Inequities remain. Gerrymandering, poll closures in selected communities, purging of voter rolls, discouraging mail ballots during the pandemic, denying the vote to former felons and other roadblocks to voting continue. Today, we may celebrate, but tomorrow we get back to work on equal rights for all. So everyone, please join us as we read in unison the words of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution. The right, the right of citizens in the United, United States, States to not vote and not be denied in the United States, States or by United any state on account, account of sex. Now, let's raise our glasses. <laughs> 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 this 100th anniversary. Happy birthday. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. So big shout out and thank you to the League of Women uh, Voters in Sanibel. Uh, can you guys all still hear me? I can. Okay, awesome. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Just just a reminder, there is no sign up sheet in the chat. All right. Let me go ahead and send that again. Um, and then I am also going to drop in the chat the bios for everybody who performed in women uh, or voices for women's suffrage. Um, and then here is the link for the diversity and inclusion. Everyone. All right. So there's the diversity and inclusion attendance sheet. Um, I am going to give this over to uh, Dr. Davey now. Uh, she will be doing a short presentation. Hello, you can all hear me? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is uh, first, I wanted to um, thank um, uh, Melissa Vandenberg um, for inviting me to um, to speak um, today at this event um, and also um, thank all of you who who put together um, that really uh, great presentation um, and what I want to do is just take a few minutes and kind of contextualize and talk about um, how these um, different actors in this um, fight for women's suffrage really came about and um, what, how they were, what, what their historical context was. Um, and so I was thinking about how can I do um, the history of women's suffrage in America from the late 18th century until 1920 in 15 minutes um, and decided that probably I couldn't do that. Um, so I want to uh, 
talk a little bit, start in the 18th century, but then speed up and go um, towards the 19th Amendment. So the start of the suffrage movement is, is generally put at 1848. And of course, 1848, um, as was mentioned in this presentation, uh, was the convention at Seneca Falls, which really is the first um, women's rights uh, convention in the US. But we've got the groundwork for that convention really being laid in the later part of the 18th century. So you see a lot of ideals that we think of as now as being really American ideals um, of individuality and of equality uh, coming out um, in the women's suffrage movement. And you see um, uh, actors like Abigail Adams um, in her Remember the Ladies letter, um, uh, really drawing from, from these sorts of ideals. Um, and we also see uh, the woman who is largely credited for um, being at the vanguard of the women's suffrage movement, um, Mary Wollstonecraft, um, also uh, uh, remembered. And Mary Wollstonecraft, just for those of you who are not familiar with her, was uh, an English woman um, and also greatly influenced um, by Enlightenment ideals um, of equality, uh, of rationality, um, and this idea that women should be able to contribute equally to society um, as, as men did. Um, so in the early part of suffrage, we actually don't see a lot of emphasis on, uh, on getting the vote. And that's something that we tend to, to associate with women's suffrage is this sort of single focus on women getting the vote. And early on in the first half of the suffrage movement, the pre-Civil War half of the suffrage movement, we really don't see that. Um, uh, so the uh, Declaration of Sentiments, for example, that is, um, that is produced at the Seneca Falls Convention, there's a lot of wrangling about whether one of the demands on the Declaration of Sentiments should actually um, involve voting. So this was a much more diversified um, portion of the, of the suffrage movement. And I want to shift to actually talking about the post-Civil War suffrage movement, the second half of the, of the movement. And you can really frame that uh, from going from 1866, um, which is the establishment of the first national women's rights organization, to, of course, 1920. Um, and this is a huge amount of time um, between, between just these two dates. Um, so in 1866, we have those iconic figures of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony establishing the American Equal Rights Association. And their goal was, and I'm going to quote here, so I'm going to look down, um, was to uh, secure equal rights to all American citizens, especially the right of suffrage, irrespective of race, color, or sex. So this organization was really dedicated to universal suffrage, meaning suffrage for all, uh, for all Americans, including African Americans and women. Um, so Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony were, were absolutely dedicated to this idea of universal suffrage. Um, and um, there's, there's some foreshadowing that suffrage is not going to be universal um, in 1868 when we get the 14th Amendment. And those of you who were um, at the presentation that Dr. Von Cannon Van did um, on uh, uh, um, Susan B. Anthony um, uh, actually trying to vote in the 1872 election, um, we'll know that Susan B. Anthony, as well as other suffragists, argued that the 14th Amendment actually gave women the right to vote because in section one of the 14th Amendment, um, it, uh, it allows um, all citizens to be voters. Um, but later on um, uh, in section two, um, 
oh, excuse me, um, in, in section one, it says all persons born and naturalized in the United States are, are citizens of the United States and citizens of the United States, um, of course, are afforded the right to vote. Um, but in section two of this amendment, it defines voters as male. So this is the first introduction of the word male um, being attached to citizenship. Um, so we have this kind of contradictory um, message going on um, in the 14th Amendment. And so we see in 1869, um, suffragists start to split. So it's only three years after the first national women's suffrage organization is established, but suffragists split between those who are focused on universal suffrage. So um, Stanton um, and Anthony, um, or those who are, um, who are interested in um, incremental suffrage. So suffrage for African Americans and then suffrage for women. Um, so we see this, uh, the, the, um, the suffragist movement really splitting into two national organizations and we get into kind of alphabet soup here. Um, we get into the American Woman Suffrage Association and the National Woman Suffrage Association. So the American Women's Suffrage Association, the AWSA, um, is established by, uh, by um, prominent individuals, Lucy Stone, her husband, Henry Blackwell, um, Julia Ward Howe, who you might know wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic, um, Henry Ward Beecher. Um, they established the AWSA and um, they support the 15th Amendment, okay? And the 15th Amendment is, of course, get it, giving um, uh, African-American men um, the right to vote. Um, now, the NWSA, the National Women's Suffrage Association, is made up of, of Stanton, of Anthony, and of others, uh, but these two women are really spearheading this organization, and they actually refuse to support the 15th Amendment. And the reason that they, they refuse to support this amendment is not because they're opposed to um, suffrage for African-American men, but they are dedicated to this idea of universal suffrage. And they're afraid that if African-American men get, um, get the vote, then women will uh, fall by the wayside. Um, so they wanted a constitutional amendment guaranteeing um, female suffrage. Um, so, so we get this real conflict, this real split um, between these figures who are, are still working towards um, somewhat of a common goal, but just in, in different ways. Now, in the 1870s, we really see suffrage picking up. So it's still, you know, almost 50 years um, before uh, the 19th Amendment, but you see the, the spread of suffrage activism on national and local levels. You see publications like the AWSA's uh, the Women's Journal and local suffrage publications um, really spreading this idea and spreading the popularity of um, American women's suffrage. And um, we get um, uh, more outspoken suffragists doing things like trying to vote in national elections. So we see that, of course, with Susan B. Anthony um, and, and other women in New York in 1872, as well as Sojourner Truth, um, who unsuccessfully demands a ballot in Battle Creek, Michigan um, at that time. Um, so, so there's lots of infighting, but these two organizations come together once again in 1890 and they become, they basically squish their names together and they become the National Women's Suffrage Associate, uh, excuse me, the National Women's Suffrage Associate, Association and the American Women's Suff Suffrage Association merge into the National American Women Suffrage Association or NASA. Um, it's facilitated by Alice Stone Blackwell. It's headed up by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And we see at this point a combination of state by state and federal campaigns for, um, uh, uh, for uh, women's suffrage. 
uh, for, um, an, an, uh, and of course this all precedes um, the 19th Amendment. Um, now, at this time, as suffrage is really heating up, there of course is a lot of opposition to women's suffrage. And there's a lot of really amazing uh, rationales um, behind um, uh, denying women the right to vote, which I won't go into here, but if you wanna hear about them, I'm happy to talk about them. Um, and we also get the spread of women's suffrage on a state-by-state -state, um, basis, particularly in the West. And there are Western states, um, uh, including Colorado, for example, that starts, um, that in 1893, um, opens the vote to women. We see Western states where women are actually given the right to vote or, or they're given the right to vote, um, not just on local elections or state elections, but also um, on a federal level. Um, so, but this is, not, um, this is not yet the law of the land. Um, so, so we get all of this heating up. Um, through the 1890s, um, and we start to see, again, some agitation between the more conservative, middle-of-the-road um, suffragists and um, suffragists who want to be a bit more radical. And it's really the radical suffragists that you think about when you think about suffrage often. Um, the ones who uh, were picketing outside the White House um, demanding that uh, the President Woodrow Wilson um, uh, pass um, the Women's Suffrage Amendment, also known as the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. And we see the passage of that amendment after um, a good amount of um, uh, political wrangling, we see the passage of that amendment. Um, finally, in 1919, it passes both the House and the Senate, goes to the states for ratification, and is finally ratified in 1920. So this is ratified in 1920, but this amendment is first introduced to Congress in 1878. Um, so it goes to Congress and it gets stalled again and again and again uh, before it finally um, is pushed through after, after much wrangling um, and, and after much um, activism, um, both uh, in terms of kind of behind the door, behind the scenes lobbying, um, as well as very in your face um, picketing um, happening. Um, on the part of, of women's suffragists. So uh, women's suffrage, um, American women's suffrage is an incredibly um, complicated, fraught, and um, really exciting piece of our history. And you know, I, I feel um, that to not vote after what these predominantly women went through Okay. white women, African-American women went through is sort of a, a disgrace. Um, and so uh, to, uh, so this is to me, um, just knowing the history of um, the struggle for suffrage um, is, is inspiration and motivation um, to vote. So um, with that, I would like to, um, I would like to, Throw it back to Bailey. Yeah, we'll go ahead and start questions. Um, I see one from Brianna Lynn, and she's asking, Dr. Davey, can you speak to the history and current state of the Equal Rights Amendment? Yeah, so that's that's fun. Um, <laughs> um, so the Equal Rights Amendment um, actually came about, uh, was first written in 1923. Um, and um, this is an amendment that um, Alice Paul really pushed for. Um, and the Equal Rights Amendment has um, gone before Congress, um, I don't know how many times, has gone before Congress um, and was um, uh, ratified by a number of states before it kind of ran out the clock um, in 1982. And it recently, uh, within the past, I don't know, in the past six months, I could be wrong, somebody correct me, but um, 
was brought up again in Congress, um, and this was championed by a number of women in Congress, and I know Nancy Pelosi um, talked a great deal about this, um, about finally ratifying the ERA. So it still is not, has not been ratified. Um, uh, the people, the, the members of Congress today who are interested in, um, in uh, pushing the Equal Rights Amendment through um, are, I don't think they're entirely Democratic, but they're almost entirely Democrats. Um, and there are, of course, a number of Republicans who, um, uh, who, are, who oppose it, including Mitch McConnell, who um, was quoted as saying that he is, some, I'm going to misquote him, but he's not particularly interested in the ERA, which I'm going to keep my rage down to a, <laughs> so that's sort of a brief overview of the ERA. And this is my cat's tail, pardon me. <laughs> All right. Um, and then we had another question from Diana Walsh um, asking, what is your favorite suffragist book? Oh, gosh. Um, gosh, I don't know. Um, there's one that just came out that I have not read that might become my favorite book um, uh, by Ellen Du Bois, who's, and it's just called Suffrage, I think. And it's, um, it's a, this um, overview of the American women's suffrage movement. And um, it's basically the only book that has done a really um, comprehensive overview of the movement since Eleanor Flexner came out with um, her book in 1959 um, about about the movement. So I haven't read it yet, but that might become. <laughs> All right. Uh, the next question is from Nancy, and she's asking, has Florida ratified the ERA? Oh, that's a good question. I, you know what? I don't know. I would honestly have to look. Uh, does Audria or Madeline happen to know? Well, I'm sure we have not ratified the ERA. Can you hear me? I don't know if you yeah. can. Yeah, we just can't. Because actually Florida did, did not even ratify the women, women's right to vote until something like 1969. So <laughs> I, I certainly don't think that, that we're, um, have ratified the ERA. That's sort of like, you know, I don't know if anybody heard what I said. 1969 is when we finally rat finally ratified the 19th Amendment. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a little crazy, right? Yeah. Um, and then I also have somebody else, Nadia, asked what countries have passed their own versions of the ERA. Which I cannot myself cannot recall off the top of my head. Ladies. I can't really speak to that. Um, I'd have to, I'd have to look into that some more, but that's, yeah, it's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. And Madeline, you asked if Ms. Anderson um, can talk about why we thought it was highlight or why, you know, it's important to highlight black suffragettes. Uh, thank you for that question. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> One of my goals when I teamed up with Maddie to do the Voices for Women's Suffrage was to highlight, and you may have noticed in, in the, the, the drama that um, we have uh, quite a number of African Americans participating. Because as you know, in our uh, books, history books through uh, K through 12, there's very little said of uh, women suff suffragists uh, in America. And what little is said is of course said of those who were the leaders of the movement and the most visible in the movement. And our purpose as we wrote the drama was to make sure that we included the important African Americans who participated in the movement. Um, they had different roles. As you know, the Southern women were very much against the uh, uh, Black women participating. However, 
black women persisted and worked around that particular challenge because uh, black women knew that in order to gain those rights because black women did not gain the right to vote when African-American males gained the right to vote. So they did put themselves out there with white women to make sure that they would gain the right to vote. So they worked very hard, as I said, probably in a different way, forming clubs, passing out leaflets, uh, coming together in rallies to make sure that they had a very strong coalition within their own community. And some of the suffragists that you saw today actually spoke in very mixed groups and did not just remain in the black communities. And those communities were separated even in the North. So there were quite a number of challenges that black uh, suffragists uh, faced, but they faced them and they remained there because they were uh, uh, motivated very highly to bring about the right to vote. And even when they brought about the right to vote or helped to bring about the right to vote in 1920, they still had more challenges, as you know, and as the history professor uh, mentioned, and as we mentioned in the drama, black women and men continued to have voter suppression working against them from the 1920s right up through today. And I'm sure if you're watching the news, you see a lot of voter suppression that's going on even today. And so the fight continues. Thank you so much, Audrea. Um, I have a question from Kaylee Heister. Um, can, she's wondering, Dr. Davey, if you believe there can be more women-based history classes taught at FGCU and what the classes could be. <laughs> Oh, you're on mute. Logan. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There. Okay. <laughs> um, it's our new reality, isn't it? <laughs> so women-based history classes. Well, um, we actually see an evolution in sort of the history of, of women's history um, so that uh, we're seeing more um, classes that are not just women's history, but also gender history, um, also history of sexuality, which I also teach. Um, a lot of different courses that where, where gender is really um, at the very core um, of the course, um, even if it's not in the title. Um, what I would argue for is a greater integration of a multiplicity of voices um, in our, um, uh, you know, in in just our basic understanding of of uh, of history, um, and of course, I'm a, an American historian, so I I, I speak from that um, I speak from that perspective. But what we tend to do is kind of section off. Um, different demographics, right? So um, here's um, uh, you know white women are doing this, and um, black women are doing this, and da, da, da. and you know, but there's so much um, integration that um, needs to happen in terms of you know where these stories meet and where they overlap. So I would argue for greater integration um, within our courses. Um, which you know, some people like to do more than others. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Melissa is asking to each of you, what does feminism mean to each of you? That women are equal to men mm -hmm. and need the same rights and equal pay, equal representation in the government and on. Are you two ladies in agreement with Madeline? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, certainly. Um, you know, at, at the heart of, of feminism is this fight for equality. That is, uh, you know, that's never ending. 
Um, and, um, you know, what, what feminism, part of what feminism means to me is understanding how complicated we are as a society and understanding um, those who are feminists are not some sort of like giant monolith feminists. Right? Um, because certainly when I teach women's history, one of the things I ask um, students is, what do you think a feminist looks, looks like? Um, and I get some pretty, you know, standard answers. Um, but there's a complexity of, of um, in the lives of people who, um, of women's lives, um, uh, and, and there's great intersection uh, between the lives of women, uh, you know, it, it, women, uh, race, gender, sexuality. So one of the things that feminism means to me is, is you know, keeping up the fight not just for women, but for sort of, you know, humanity um, in general, and our understanding that that we all deserve, um, all deserve this this equality, which sometimes in in the present day is often a, a taxing thing. Mm -hmm. In addition to what's been said, I will briefly say, uh, just as the professor was saying, uh, women's rights are human rights. And I'll boil it down to something very personal. When women are in a boardroom or in any situation and women offer an opinion or uh, information to the discussion, it would be wonderful mm -hmm. and equal to have men simply accept that rather than expect or want to explain what the woman has said and said very clearly. Uh, <laughs> this mansplaining thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's another example of what feminism means to me. <laughs> treat me the same way in a conversation that you would treat the next person who may happen to be a guy. <laughs> Very well said, well said. <laughs> so this is going to be my last question. Um, and this is from Kaylee Dietrich. Uh, she said, during the fight for the 19th Amendment, we hear a lot about the relationship between Black women and white women. Were Native populations involved in these activities as well? So um, I can, I, I know about this much about, uh, unfortunately, about Indigenous women. Um, during uh, during suffrage, yes, um, indigenous mm -hmm. women had a role um, in in suffrage, and certainly it wasn't a central role, and it wasn't um, you know it wasn't a very visible role. And one of the things that um, uh, one of the things that that um, suffrage tackles is this idea of citizenship, and um, you know women are really during this time are struggling to, um, to claim um, their right of citizenship as our indigenous people um, who are only recognized by the federal government in the mid 1920s as, um, right. as having mm -hmm. rights of citizenship, ironically. Yeah, they didn't gain the right of citizenship till 1924. Mm -hmm. There's a group of Native American people in upstate New York. I think, you know, we would maybe call them the Iroquois or the, the Oneida group, but they're called Say, I believe. I'm not sure how to say the name. I was searching for this book that I have. But they have um, kind of a constitution, and Susan B. Anthony and many of the women who lived in that area of the country were very, very influenced by those Native women because although the men were the chiefs, the women were the ones who, who were there making decisions. The, a decision could not be made without them. So they were very inspirational to many of the women who were in that area of the country and who we know as the first feminist, quote unquote. How do you say? I don't know, Professor, do you know that name? Um, I'm sorry, which name? This tribe that's in upstate, that was, and her probably still is in upstate New York, around the area where, around the Seneca Falls area. Mm -hmm. um, Susan, Susan Anthony, mm -hmm. 
so forth, knew these women and borrowed many ideas from their constitution. Right, I mean, they were the Iroquois. Um, and called Howden Say, I think. I don't know, we'd have to look it up. No, I know Iroquois. Yeah, yeah. S similar. Yeah. I, think, I think the thing that just should be emphasized is that women gaining the vote was the most, it was such an incredible social movement. I mean, think about women's roles where they could, they, if they were to leave their husbands, the husband would have the children. I mean, the, the women were such, they were just property of their husbands. And through this whole period, mm -hmm. these women and men, and Frederick Douglass was in the vanguard with them, were able to totally transform the way this country is, although we still have work to do, obviously because white men still are holding on to power and, you know, will be as long as we let them vote. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank everyone for those questions. Um, for, and I will go ahead. I think uh, Dr. Davey had one last thing that she wanted to say or Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to introduce um, the Dean of the Bradshaw Library, um, Dean Tracy Elliott, for her closing remarks. I did not mute either. <laughs> so thank you, Ms. Stewart and Ms. Anderson and Dr. Davey. Uh, first of all, for you two ladies, I, I want to thank you for your leadership in our community. I mean, it, it means so much to us that you, especially as a library um, and a university, that you are fighting for valid information about voting and about elections that we are all so dependent upon and for, for working so diligently to make that available to all of us. The League of Women Voters is, a, is an organization that all of us should be aspiring to be. <laughs> and um, we really appreciate it. And what you've done for us tonight is an, another example of how fantastic you are as an organization. And, and um, so I, I just wanna thank you both for being here and inspiring us to do this program. I also wanna thank Dr. Davey, of course, for, for your lecture, um, always a pleasure. And, and I want to thank Melissa's thanking you all, but we all have to thank Melissa and Bailey, who without the two of them, we wouldn't be here this evening at all. And I don't want to take away from the importance of the work that they do. They are phenomenal. Every time they, I see one of these events, I'm, I'm always blown away, particularly by Bailey and her professionalism. She's so good at this. Um, but for those of you who have attended, I wanna thank you all. It means so much to us as a library. Please, please look at our uh, online exhibit. There's so much work put into this. And, um, and then for those of you who can, if you could contribute to the good work of uh, Special Collections and archi University Archives, there is a link on our site as well as on the foundation page. And so, we, we hope that if you can give, one of the things we're, we're happy to do is mail out that fantastic poster that, uh, that, um, you have, that we have on the exhibit. Um, but also just a big thank you for you all being here tonight. In many ways, that's, that's the most we can ask and, and that we're, we celebrate the most. But thank you all again, fantastic evening. And uh, I've just, I'm so excited to celebrate this amazing, occasion of our 100th year anniversary of the right for all of us to vote. It's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.